But I want to start by asking about news of the day and an office that's mentioned in the Constitution, Speaker of the House. Yes. Is, is your party's search for a new speaker a crisis or not? No, it's not a crisis at all. Uh, I think it's a very positive thing, you know, that uh, Representative McCarthy, in a very unselfish move, uh, said, I want to do what's best for the party right now and uh, open the process up. I be, I, I'm hopeful that many people will have a chance to speak out about their leadership style and uh, we can have a vote that brings people together. There's sort of two schools of thought. Now, I'm pretty sure you don't want to name your favorite candidate, but there's two schools of thought. One is someone associated with Speaker Boehner and someone who's a newer figure, maybe someone uh, 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 newer to Congress. Of those two options, which do you think would be a smarter thing, a better thing? Uh, well, I, th I think uh, they both should uh, explain their vision and let the members vote. Okay. In, in thinking about the traits you'd like to see in a new speaker, what's, what are those? Well, I want to see courage. Uh, you know, I've been, like many Americans, somewhat disappointed by the fact that, you know, Congress has largely taken an observatory role. And uh, the executive branch and the judicial branch have been more active. And, you know, we need to have a balance of powers, you know, checks and balances here. And uh, that doesn't happen. And when, when one branch backs off, the others necessarily become more vigorous. You, you, you said a second ago that you, uh, you give uh, Congressman McCarthy credit in some ways for the decision that he made. Do you fully believe the explanation that he offered, or do you think there might be something else going on here? Well, I haven't heard his full explanation. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I, whatever the explanation is, I think it was the right thing. Right. Okay. Um, you were able to take a look at uh, the focus groups that we did in Iowa, New Hampshire, Mark and I, uh, which were, uh, I would say, uh, pretty much unequivocally, you were a big winner in some sense in those groups. Um, how odd is it, as you sit there and listen to people talk about the things they like about you, um, how does that feel to you, to hear people describing you, uh, the personal terms that they use? How does that feel as you sit here as a human being? Well, you know, I'm gratified to know that people appreciate, you know, the manner in which I've, I've tried to conduct my life. You know, I, you know, I don't have a lot of skeletons for people to find. Right. I try to be honest. Um, I'm not a politician, right. so my finger's not up in the air all the time trying to figure out what people want to hear. As we talk to people in those rooms about things that are, that these are all undecided voters. They're not yet in your column. They've not decided yet to vote for you. The things, the reservations they have about you, they think maybe you lack energy. They think maybe you lack experience, uh, especially on the international stage. Um, they think maybe you're not, don't have enough specific policies. What, how do you hope to close the deal with people who are personally predisposed to like you but still have those reservations? Well, I think that's why it's a marathon and not a sprint. Over the course of time, they'll be able to see. You know, I'm pretty energetic. I just don't uh, yell and scream. You know, anybody who can stand at an operating room table for 8, 10, 12 hours right. and keep your concentration has got to be fairly energetic. You know, as, as far as foreign policy is concerned, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that at some of these debates they'll actually ask me about some foreign policy <laughs> and not just ask me race questions or, uh, you know, something that they think I might know. So your book's called A More Perfect Union. You're a doctor writing about the Constitution. There have been lots of books written by the Constitu about the Constitution. What is the perspective you're bringing to these issues as a doctor and now as a politician? Well, also as a citizen. You know, our Constitution was written basically at an eighth grade level. And, you know, there are a lot of people who say, well, you're not a constitutional scholar. You don't have a right to talk about the Constitution. The Constitution was written so that we, the people, could understand it. And uh, the purpose is not only to define what our liberties are, but to contain the government. There's a natural tendency for government to grow and encroach upon people's freedoms. And if they don't understand how the system is set up, it makes it that much easier for that natural tendency to be realized. It's been a while since we've amended the Constitution. People think because of the gridlock and the nature of our politics now, it won't happen again anytime soon. If you could, by yourself, unilaterally put into effect two amendments, what would they be? Well, one would be term limits. Uh, on congressmen, senators, and the other one would be term limits on the judicial branch. What, would, what, le what length would you like to see for the judiciary? Well, you know, when we uh, put the Constitution in place, the average age of death was 47. And now, you know, it's like 80. And 
you know, I would, I don't think that we necessarily need to have people who are, you know, well advanced in age when we have so many capable people below. And I would be very happy to engage in a discussion about what that age should be. Give me a range. Would you say you're term limited based on how old you are or the long length of time you could serve? Uh, I think maybe a combination uh, of both. One of the things that, that, that we showed our focus group was your comments about not being in favor of the idea of having someone who is a Muslim be president of the United States. There are many people who objected to that on constitutional grounds and pointed to the Constitution itself and said, look, the Constitution explicitly says there should be no religious test. How do you reconcile your view of yourself as a constitutionalist, having written this book, with that question? The Constitution also says we have freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And I said that I wouldn't advocate for such. I didn't say that I would preclude such from happening. So that's perfectly consistent with the Constitution. And also, I made it very clear before, uh, during that same interview, that anybody from any background, religious or otherwise, who was willing to accept American values and principles and who was willing to put the Constitution above their personal belief would be acceptable. That should have been the end of it, but it was pressed further, uh, indicating that perhaps maybe uh, someone in the Muslim faith would not fit into that category. Right. And if they didn't, the reason that they wouldn't fit into that category obviously would be their embracing of Sharia, which is incompatible with our Constitution. Right. The book, again, is called A More Perfect Union, What We the People Can Do to Reclaim Our Constitutional Liberties by Dr. Ben Carson and Candy Carson. How would you guys split up the writing? Uh, she does most of the research, uh -huh. and I do most of the writing.